Well, hello everyone, and welcome to today's IAQ Matters expert panel, Metabolic Health and Healthy Buildings, Strategies for Lasting Outcomes. My name is Troy Raska, and I'm the Marketing and Communications Director for Pure Air Control Services, and I have three very special guest panelists with me today. Uh, but before we jump in, I want to just address a few housekeeping issues and uh, let you know that we have handouts, and they are in the handouts tray of your GoToWebinar application on your screen. And that will be a very special uh, promo of uh, Dr. Ovidia's book. Uh, it is a, a brochure on Pure Air Control Services Healthy Buildings Program and an informative brochure on our IAQ Guard 2.0 monitoring system, real-time monitoring system. So uh, we'll probably be talking about each of these things uh, in detail today. And so these are good supplemental materials that you can go ahead and download. Uh, after the webinar concludes, there'll be a short survey. Uh, it gets uh, us to know you better, and it also lets you have some feedback to let us know how we have done today. Uh, and of course, you will be getting a follow-up email uh, with these handout materials and a link to the video replay of today's expert panel. So uh, why don't we just jump right in. Uh, with me today, I have three very special guest panelists, and that is Dr. Philip Ovidia, uh, medical doctor and cardiac surgeon, uh, Dr. Rajiv Sahai, our chief science officer and director of environmental diagnostics laboratory here at Pure Air Control Services, and Alan Wozniak, a certified indoor environmental consultant and the president and founder of Pure Air Control Services. So welcome, gentlemen. Great to be here with you. Excellent, yes. Thank, Thank you very much. Beautiful day in Florida. So uh, before we get started, I just wanna give you a really quick background on each of these uh, panelists today so you kind of know who's talking and, and how they're addressing the topics that come up. Uh, and first up is Dr. Ovidia and uh, he's a board certified cardiac surgeon, and he is the founder of Ovidia Heart Health. So as a heart surgeon, uh, you know, he was once morbidly obese himself, and he realized that, hey, a, a change, a significant change had to happen to his own metabolic health. Uh, and so he has seen firsthand uh, what the failures of like mainstream diets and, and mainstream medicine uh, has done to folks in this country and abroad. Uh, and so he realized what helped him lose uh, over 100 pounds was focusing on his metabolic health. And so it's the same solution uh, that could have prevented most of the thousands of op open heart surgeries that he's performed over the years. So as uh, you can see on, on this slide, there's his uh, link to ovidiahearthealth.com. Uh, and it's also worth noting that uh, he has published a book recently and that book is called Stay Off My Operating Table, A Heart Surgeon's Metabolic Health Guide to Lose Weight, Prevent Disease, and Feel Your Best Every Day. So it, it, makes, it truly makes the case uh, for a, a metabolic first approach to improving your heart health and really overall health and well-being. And of course, that book is available uh, at Amazon. It, it's available for the Kindle app and, and I believe hard copies uh, as well. Next, we have Dr. Rajiv Sahai, and he is a PhD, uh, and he is the Chief Sciences Officer for Pure Air Control Services. And, and you'll recognize Dr. Sahai from the many workshops that we have done over the years uh, together. And so uh, it's always uh, a, a welcome pleasure to have him on with us. So he has more than 25 years of experience in, in doctoral and postdoctoral levels of experimental and analytical research. So specifically, this is microbiology, microbiology and environmental sciences. So he's well-versed in some very specialized areas of microbiology, including aerobiology, which is the study of microbes in the air, mycology, which is the study of molds and fungi, uh, environmental bacteriology, microscopy and immunochemistry, as well as uh, paleontological techniques for the sampling and identification of aerobiota and other environmental contaminants of concern. So all told, Dr. Sahai has authored over 50 publications uh, that are in print 
and is a frequent lecturer of microbiology and indoor air quality. And then last but certainly not least is the founder and president of Pure Air Control Services, a, a man I've had the pleasure of working with over the last six years. I've learned a lot from him, uh, certainly on the built environment and indoor air quality, but that's Alan Wozniak. And uh, so he's a, a certified air quality professional, certified indoor environmental consultant. So Pure Air Controls was founded in 1984. And since that time, uh, we've serviced over 900 million square feet in more than 19,000 buildings. Uh, and that's globally, uh, nationally, as well as internationally. And uh, we serve the government, healthcare, education, and commercial markets, including entertainment markets, like a lot of the theme parks, uh, hotels, resorts, things of that nature. Uh, and so last year, Alan successfully managed the sale of Pure Air Control Services to this Fortune 500 company called RPM International. And so uh, Mr. Wozniak himself, has authored numerous articles on IAQ. He's a Newsweek magazine expert, author, and contributor, and has been a guest lecturer on many webinars, workshops, and other symposiums. So, uh, as I said, you know, we were founded in '84. We're now part of the Trimco Construction Products Group. We have three specialized divisions that focus on building sciences, uh, environmental laboratory services, and then building remediation and restoration. Of course, we have one company as well uh, that focuses on actual products, air purification units, air cleaners, uh, do-it-yourself test kits for testing the environment. And so, uh, of course, all of our divisions are well-respected and maintain all of their certifications and education uh, needed to do the utmost professional job at all times. So, gentlemen, we're here today to talk about metabolic health in human beings as well as uh, sort of the same approach for building health and, and how these two uh, things sort of cross over in, in the places that we live, learn, and work, and uh, sort of how they affect each other. And so today we just want it to be an open forum. We have some prepared questions or thought starters to get a conversation going, which I'm sure there'll be no lack of. And then uh, folks in the audience, we encourage you to ask questions in the questions tray and we will get to answering those uh, if they're relevant to what we're talking about at the time. Uh, we'll answer them in real time, but typically we reserve some time at the end uh, to ask questions. So uh, let's get started. Uh, guys, listen, you know, what we eat and drink, what we breathe, this is all important to us uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, starting with you, Dr. Ovidia, uh, how, does, how does what we eat, drink, and breathe uh, affect us? You know, why is it important? Yeah, so, you know, when we look at what determines our health, it turns out um, that the inputs that we are giving our body uh, are the most important determinant of our health. And the import inputs that, you know, we give our bodies come in the form of the food that we eat, um, and it also comes in the form of the air that we breathe and the environment that we're exposing ourselves to. Um, realize that our two biggest uh, organs, per se, are our skin and our gastrointestinal tract. And those are also the two parts of our body that are exposed uh, to the outside environment. So, you know, whether it's food that we're eating, whether it's air that we're breathing in, whether it's things that we are absorbing through our skin from the environment, um, these are the primary determinants of our health. And when I talk about health, um, I try to educate people about what I call metabolic health. And what metabolic health is, in its you know kind of easiest explanation, is it's our body's ability to properly utilize the inputs that we are given it. So you know we have to go back when there is something wrong with our health. Um, the first question we should be asking ourselves is, are we taking in something uh, that is damaging our health, damaging our metabolic health? And the vast majority of the answers to our health problems can be found from, you know, that sort of root level analysis of uh, what we are doing and what we are taking in. 
Wow, that's excellent. Yeah, that, and and even I understood it, and I'm a I'm a lay person, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, Alan, why don't you explain maybe in a similar fashion uh, how these things affect uh, us environmentally? You know, like so, how is a building affected uh, by the inputs that it's receiving? Absolutely. Uh, the 19,000 buildings that we've studied, we, we traverse the buildings in a number of ways to identify the baseline conditions. And we're looking for things that potentially can be injurious to uh, people's health, uh, like Dr. Ovidia's uh, baseline conditions when he studies patients. We study buildings in a similar way. Uh, the ventilation system, the building pressurization, the the, uh, the the HVAC cleanliness, the, the HVAC system is the lungs of the building. And if you have a nasty, filthy, dirty, microbial infested ventilation system, that has a potential effect on the building and building occupants. So as building practitioners, we're going, we, we want to study what is a baseline condition and rather than just throw, um, things at a building and hope something works, we look at it uh, more prescriptively, uh, identify the potential problems of the building, if there are any, and then come up with a prescriptive solution as to how it can get better. Oftentimes, uh, air purifiers, for example, are thrown at a building or, or installed in a building uh, when in fact there is a hemorrhaging condition occurring that you know, there's a microbial infestation, there's the building super negative, uh, et cetera. So it really plays no bigger a part than a doorstop uh, air purification unit if you don't understand the building dynamics. So we're, we're about understanding the buildings and coming up with prescriptive solutions to buildings. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I mean, we we spend as human beings 90% of our time indoors, and we breathe about 3,000 gallons of air a day. And it, and as humans, sometimes we seem more focused on you know the water that we're drinking. Is it purified? Is it clean? Uh, as opposed to is the air around us clean? Is is the the superficial uh, areas of the building clean that we're touching and and, and interacting with and so forth. Uh, Dr. Sahai, uh, why don't you sort of talk about maybe the, the big three or four contaminants of concern that might be inside of a building that could negatively impact uh, human health? Yes, uh, that definitely uh, we can focus on that. But before we go there, I just want to emphasize what previously Dr. Ovidia and Mr. Alan Wozniak said that like we can leave, you know, several days without food, maybe a few days without water, but guess what? Hardly a few minutes without air. So we all live in environment, maybe it is outdoor or indoor, right? So we are continuously exposed to that. So they have sort of relation going on between us and the surrounding. So why I'm saying that? Because continuously we are getting the exposure. So exposure in terms of three major pathway. The first one is inhalation. And you will be surprised to know that our 80% of daily intake is in terms of air. We breathe almost 22,000 times a day. A healthy individual can like, you know, and that's why Troy was telling that the volume of the air. So that is one of the very important. And having said that, there is a like survey done by the various agencies about like you know up to 20 percent people are suffering from one or other kind of allergy this is just only one factor so now think about this so three or four major cause like alan said like the number one is that if you are inside the building you are going to get exposure by various kind of toxin toxin in terms of microbes in terms of various abiotic component. So we need to study them. That's what Alan is referring, because out of sight, out of mind, if you don't know what you are dealing with, it is just like a doctor writing a prescription without doing any kind of test. And that's not a very good practice. So that's what we do 
and that is three or four main focal thing about the environmental condition number one try number second that what kind of microbial biota or other aerobiological component both biotic and embiotic is there who are the occupants how many the occupants are there in that space and then fourth and most important one that how long you are being exposed to those those kind of situations so that we can find out to be good for you or it is going to adversely affect your health makes sense no that makes perfect sense and i, I think uh, all three of you have touched on this a little bit uh, and and that is you know maybe let's think about uh, talking about treating the causes uh, and not the symptoms because it seems in modern medicine and even in building maintenance right uh, people are, are quick to try to treat a symptom but but they're not so quick or, or don't want to make the commitment to look at the underlying causes uh, of the symptoms that are presenting so dr. Uh, Ovidia Maybe you can talk talk to us a little bit about when you start to look at someone's medical health and do that workup. Uh, what is the difference between looking at the root cause and just the symptom? Sure thing, and uh, you're exactly correct. You know, our healthcare system is built around managing symptoms and managing disease, and it is infrequent that um, you know our our healthcare system, our physicians, uh, do get to those root causes of the problem. Uh, but it's amazing what can happen when you do do that, uh, because I now see, you know, on a routine basis with the patients that I work with and, and other physicians uh, that I, you know, interact with that use similar uh, methods, that we can reverse many of the chronic diseases that we are facing, things like diabetes and high blood pressure. And by doing so, we can prevent you know, the big things that we all get concerned about, things like heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's disease. And that all comes from asking the questions and looking for those root cause problems, the, the root causes of these problems. And you have to start again with, you know, what is the food that you are eating? What is the air that you are breathing in like? Um, all of these things, you know, that we find the vast majority of the time are the problem. Occasionally, of course, there are, you know, things that go wrong with our bodies, genetic things or or otherwise uh, that, you know, may have to do with the, you know, might not have to do with the environment. Uh, but the vast majority of the time, what I end up seeing is um, that these problems start with the environment. And one interesting parallel, you know, just to note, uh, that we were talking about the statistics about, you know, how many of the buildings are unhealthy. Well, we see the same thing with people. We know, for instance, that 88% of the adults in the United States are not metabolically healthy, almost nine out of 10 people. And we need to start asking why that might be. And, uh, you know, again, it comes down to what we're eating, what we are breathing in, and how we are interacting with our environment. No, that, that's a great point. Uh, Alan, uh, why don't you maybe talk about the correlation in buildings of treating uh, symptoms and not causes? You know, facility managers always putting fires out versus being proactive. I think, guys, what we're talking about here is being proactive, both with human health and with building health. Yes. Uh, an example, uh, we had a, a recent project where uh, a university called us out to identify um, mold in a dormitory facility, um, and, and that the the mold on a, in a dorm or any building is a symptom of the problem and not the cause. So we went out. Our building science team went out, identified why the mold is there. The mold just doesn't populate, even though it's ubiquitous. It doesn't populate and just exist and, and grow in, 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 in abundance. It has to have the nutrients, humidity, moisture, et cetera. So in this building, we, we, uh, we did see the mold. It was visible on surfaces, on, on books, on counters, uh, desks, walls. And what we found was the building was super negatively pressurized. You could say the building sucked in, in more ways than one. Um, 
when you have a negative pressurized building, what you're doing is you're you're allowing all the outside effluents, which we know by studying 19,000 buildings, that the outdoor air is going to be uh, 10 times, 100 times worse than indoor air. Uh, so we're we're allowing unfiltered, unconditioned air into the building. Number one. Number two is the building ventilation system was is super impacted microbially. Uh, it had at least 50% of the face of the coil was impacted to the point where no air would cross. Then the, the HVAC system ductwork plenums had a, a super amount of microbial contamination as a result of the lack of, in this case, deferred maintenance. Med medically, you know, you know, deferred maintenance could be that of someone not taking care of their health and their 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 well-being. In the in the case of a building, it's the the deferred maintenance of a building. If if they let the building fall apart, it's going to have adverse effects in multiple ways. So our suggestion was to fix the ventilation system. Let's fix the the defer the uh, the HVAC system to the point of of it being environmentally clean as well as the the, the ventilation pressurization deficiency. So we ended up, uh, we made the suggestions, but they they had just got, a, they ordered a thousand air purifiers just months before and they just came in. So they said, well, yeah, that makes sense. We wanna do that, but we, we're we gonna try, we're gonna clean the mold off and then just put in some of these air purifiers in the building, in the dormitories, and we hope that'll solve the problem. And we said, well, Frankly, it's not going to solve it, but you know you can try that. That's what you want to do. I get a call about a month later, a frantic call from the same university saying, "When you know the solution that you proposed, when can you get out here and fix it?" And uh, so I said, "Well, what, just out of curiosity, why is it an emergency today?" He said, "Well, we have four students have come down with fun fungal infections that are hospitalized, and we feel it's." due to the building. So, you know, that's a that's not a good, you know, if, if one was a a, um, a, 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 a a father or, or mother of these students, you'd be very concerned with the decision-making process and the risk that they're allowing in the building. So long story short, we end up fixing the ventilation problem, the, we fix the, the pressurization problem, and that's been months and months ago, and it's not reoccurred, and that solved the problem. So, classic example of treating a symptom and not a cause. And uh, but but the sad part about it is we see this in abundance in across the across America, across the globe. Uh, Doctor Avedia's 90% um, building uh, or or individuals not being metabolically healthy. I would have to say, based on our experience, it's probably close to that. Seventy to eighty percent of buildings uh, have problems, and and buildings buildings don't get sick. Um, people do, but buildings will make people sick due to the conditions. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, and and of course, I think uh, uh, COVID nineteen, right, the pandemic certainly brought both human health and building health into sharp focus and, 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 and where they intersect as well with, with uh, you know, office worker confidence being low to return to buildings, people looking more at their immune systems, uh, you know, over time to see uh, if, if uh, you know, they're going to be able to take the virus or take the uh, vaccine and, and if it's going to have any negative side effects. So I do feel that like, like human health and, and healthy buildings, uh, the bar has been raised, so to speak. Um, so when we talk about uh, successful outcomes, like Alan, you were just talking about, uh, Dr. Ovidia, you know, how do you measure successes in metabolic health, and, and really, for that matter, uh, Alan and, and Dr. Sahai and, and building health? Yeah, so you know when we uh, look at metabolic health, we have uh, five you know basic measures that we use to assess that in people, and those measures are your waist circumference, 
Uh, so you just take a tape measure. You can do this at home. You, you measure just above the level of your belly button. And uh, if you are a man, you want that to be less than 40 inches. And if you are a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches. And then uh, our next metric is your blood pressure. Um, your blood pressure should be less than 130 over 85 without the use of medications. If you have been prescribed medications for high blood pressure, that is a sign that you are not metabolically healthy. Yeah. We then look at some very basic blood work and everyone should get this done you know, on a routine basis uh, as part of their uh, physical examinations. You wanna look at your blood glucose level, the amount of sugar that's in your blood. And this is when you haven't eaten for about eight to 12 hours, your fasting blood glucose it's called, and it should be less than 100 uh, milligrams per deciliters is the units we use here in the United States. And finally, we look at the cholesterol panel, but it's important to note that the main number that everyone talks about on the cholesterol panel, the LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, is not a metric of metabolic health. The mm -hmm. other two numbers on that panel are your HDL cholesterol, also, you know, always called your good cholesterol. And because you know, it's called good cholesterol because we want that to actually be higher. Uh, and specifically, if you were a man, you want it to be over 40. If you were a woman, you want it to be over 50. And finally, uh, we look at your triglyceride level and you want that to be less than 150. And uh, if you didn't get all those, um, I have a very quick tool on my website at ifixhearts.co uh, that will actually you know, assess your metabolic health based on those metrics. Um, but if you have three or more of those metrics abnormal, um, it diagnoses you with what we call the metabolic syndrome. And that means that you are at very high risk for diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, many forms of cancer have been associated with the metabolic syndrome. Mm. If one or two of those are abnormal, it's a warning sign because we know that people who have one or two abnormal today are likely to progress to the metabolic syndrome over the next five to 10 years. Uh, so important first to figure out those numbers, like uh, Dr. Sahay was talking about, you have to do the assessment first, you have to do the testing to figure out where you're at. And uh, as I mentioned before, um, based on, you know, those five metrics, only 12% of the adults in the United States today can meet all five measures of optimal metabolic health. So important for everyone to get their numbers checked and to find out where you stand on your metabolic health. And if it's not where you want it to be, have that conversation with your physician about what you should be doing to improve it. Right, and so successful outcomes would be uh, getting those numbers uh, into a good baseline, right, for your your personal health based on your your uh, sex, your age, probably, right, and then maintaining it. And I'm sure that there's recommendations on how to uh, one lower those numbers so that that you're within a good baseline and then maintaining them. Um, and so, and that's probably how you would measure the success over the long term. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, one of the concepts I talk about often with people is, you know. We focus too much on things like weight and, uh, you know, uh, it turns out that although weight does correlate with metabolic health, it's not, you know, completely determinant of it. Uh, important to note that people who are normal weight or even what are considered underweight uh, still have about a 50% incidence of not being metabolically healthy. So you can't just assume because you're a normal weight that you're metabolically healthy. You need to check the metrics, and I use those metrics, you know, as the outcome measures as well. As we see those numbers improve, we see people's overall health improve, and we know in the long term that keeping those numbers in check where they should be will help to prevent things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Wow, yeah, that, that's excellent. Um, Alan, you know, it, it, as it relates to building health, I mean, what, how do we measure success, uh, you know, in creating a good baseline and maintaining it? Yeah, so at, at the, the, the old saying, you can't manage what you can't measure is so true. It's not only true in medicine, but it's true in buildings as well. 
like Yogi Berra probably said it best, you, you don't know where you, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up uh, somewhere else. And, and that's in the, in the, in the case of indoor quality, if you, if you just start throwing stuff, products at a building, uh, there's a chance it's going to help a little bit, but until you understand the baseline conditions and st until you understand the the degree of, of um, deferred maintenance, if any, uh, no product is going to help uh, solve a problem uh, if there if there is one. And again, I, I I'd go back to Dr. Avidia's in the medical profession. Um, if if one did not uh, evaluate a patient and go through the blood makeup and evaluation, x-rays, uh, et cetera, that that would be considered a form of malpractice. And and no doctor in their right mind would do that just arbitrarily. Yeah, you don't feel good. Okay, here's a, here's a prescription, for example. And, and that's really what, what unfortunately, uh, in the, in the, era of indoor air quality and COVID, which has really blossomed the, the understanding of indoor air quality and why it's important. But very few look at buildings in the way that, that it, they should be, and that's in developing the baseline conditions. Um, when we study a building, as I referred to, we look at uh, the microbial um, a load of the building, we look at the ventilation cleanliness, we look at the building pressurization, VOCs, allergens, uh, dust mite, pollen, cockroach allergen, dog allergen, a number of things, endotoxins, mycotoxins. In order to, to determine the health of a building, we have to, and that's critical, we have to evaluate the building. Otherwise, you're just, you know, you're, you're really just throwing money out the window uh, not knowing. Uh, Dr. Avidia recently had his, he had an issue at his home, air quality wise, and the, the from what I understand, the, the contractor pretty much just sort of, you know, went around, didn't really identify any particular issues, and ended up not really solving the problem, and they continued to have issues in, in their home, and, and this is so true with so many buildings and that's why i urge our clients to let's evaluate let's take a time out let's evaluate the building and then prescriptively let's find out what needs to be done in order to uh improve the condition and in fact create that healthy building that we we all want you know i think that's a great yeah. point and and really if you think about it uh no two human beings are exactly the same in, in, in their metabolic makeup and their physiology. Even if they're identical twins, there, there's likely to be uh, major differences between how, uh, you know, they're, they're put together, right? And that's the same with buildings, you know. There's no two buildings that are exactly the same. An architect could design the same exact building. They could be sitting side by side and different things could be happening inside of those buildings independently of one another. So I, I think that that both of you are absolutely right. You have to understand the baseline conditions. You have to take, based on that data and the science, you have to take corrective action uh, specific uh, to what you're seeing and then continue to measure uh, to, to make yeah. sure that those, those baselines are met. Yeah. No, I wanted to emphasize that what uh, Mr. Alan Wozniak and Dr. Ovidia has said earlier that people get sick building don't but as we all understand now that like there are two major factors for like you know metabolic health and the building or healthy building what are those two factors like in case of like you know the individual it is the genetics but at the same time genetics is one of the things which you can deep down uh, more explore that what is wrong with that but at the same time the low hanging fruit is the environmental factor which is obviously overlooked time and time, because what is environmental factor, first of all? The factor which we have all air, water, and all the resources, that is like having some kind of like, you know, uh, parameter that need to be 
implemented for an example right temperature right humidity in ideal world you know right food these are going to be one of the thing which can make you healthy but at the same time like alan was emphasizing those environmental factor including the moisture disbalance including the various kind of particulate matters like pm 2.5 to pm 1 which is inhabitable particle range that basically work as an vacuum so there is a lot of floating microbes that can be just like you know adhere with those particles and they are going to make entry and like dr ovidia was saying that skin is the first thing which is continuously exposed so that skin maybe like you know due to the contact you can have like a lot of impact and since the microbes tend to get morpho like you know morphological change what we call like you know the uh various kind of changes not only one type of changes and it can be just like you know going to affect adversely to human health as well so sometime our body is very good system but at the same time like outer factor the environmental condition make those organisms like metamorphose or like you know mutate or something like that that is going to penetrate in your body which your body is not capable of like you know handling it and especially those who are having a compromised immune system or their immunity is not that strong they are at a higher risk so i would highly encourage that this environmental factor which uh, mr wozniak was referring earlier is one of the thing like dr ovidia takes some of the parameter from the human body to treat right that's why the building condition can be treated only when you have like you know those condition met meaning you have done some testing make sense no, it makes sense, Dr. Sahai, and, and I think also touching on that point a little bit is when you start to look at hospital-acquired infections, uh, there, there is, and this could be a whole topic for another expert panel, but there is uh, data to back up that like over-sanitization of uh, certain areas of the environment can create, I guess you could explain it better, but what's called superbugs, because, because some of these microbes will develop a resistance to certain technologies or uh, you know cleaning chemicals and such is that right exactly yeah that is a very uh, big problem perhaps uh, dr ovidia might be facing when he treats the patient but as a microbiologist i can tell you that the continuous or reluctant use of the antibiotics making like those kind of super bug and sometimes even various cocktails of antibiotics is not going to work and it is going to be like really really hard for physicians to treat their patients so uh, like yeah. you know overusing or like you know various kind of disbalance in environment can create those kind of mutant variety what i call and that is going to be very difficult to treat and and i have seen that and like you know in the developed country like united states the hia uh, hospital acquired infection rate is about three percent if you go to the developing country it is about seven percent as per the world health organization wow yeah. Well, listen, hey, I, I know uh, time's getting on and we could stay on all day talking about stuff, but I kind of want to switch gears and maybe get a little anecdotal uh, because I understand uh, that Dr. Ovidia and, and Alan are actually clients of one another. And so I, I think it'd be kind of interesting to flip the script a little bit and have you, Dr. Ovidia, sort of describe um, your encounter or, or your interaction with us, as Alan alluded to earlier, testing your house uh, in your home uh, for some indoor air quality issues that you were experiencing. And then, Alan, if, if you could respond in kind of what it's been like being a patient of Dr. Ovidia. So, uh, doctor? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, uh, my uh, family uh, had some uh, lingering health problems, you know, after we had, uh, you know, cleaned up our diets and started eating better, and uh, you know, my wife and I both lost a lot of weight and we're, you know, doing pretty well, uh, but there were still some lingering issues. And as we dug deeper into those, one of the things that we discovered uh, was that uh, my wife, especially, um, had some mold toxicity. And so, you know, we had uh, the house evaluated at first, and uh, one of the companies came in and they did some remediation um efforts uh but the uh, results of that were a little disappointing uh we still had uh mold at the end of it and uh started probing deeper and fortunately i was able to connect with alan and the uh, team from uh, pure air 
uh, control came in and did a comprehensive assessment of the house and ongoing monitoring. And, uh, you know, we are now uh, working through those issues. Uh, but, you know, similar to what I do with people around their health, where oftentimes they've gone to a physician who hasn't been able to fix their problems um, because, again, they're not looking for the root causes of those problems. Um, when it came to our house's uh, health, our air quality, um, it, you know, it was only when I uh, got in contact, you know, was lucky enough to connect with Pure Air Controls uh, that we are finally evaluating and treating, you know, the root causes of, of the problems within our house. Wow, yeah, that's that's amazing. And, and you can see firsthand uh, with some of these air quality monitoring devices that we, we sort of put the power uh, of an industrial hygienist at your own fingertips. You're able to log in and actually see uh, the different parameters that are being uh, monitored uh, with these devices, which I'm sure is uh, very interesting to you, uh, you know, being a doctor. Uh, yeah, Alan, Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it is actually an interesting parallel because you know one of the one of the uh, uh, innovations I would say that has come to medicine that you know we're starting to utilize more and more are uh, remote patient monitors and being able to monitor things in real time. Uh, you know, so uh, for instance, you know we now have continuous glucose monitors that a patient can wear. And, you know, my patients will be wearing it and it will come to a dashboard like this and I'll be able to see what their blood sugar does throughout the day and what it does in response to them eating foods and activities. So uh, it gives us that high level information uh, that we need to be able to diagnose, you know, the root cause problems. Wow, that's excellent. Uh, Alan, you know, why don't you share a little bit of your experience being a, a patient? Uh, you know, on the other side with Dr. Ovidia. Absolutely. In fact, uh, both my wife and I are patients of Dr. Ovidia's, and we're, we're blessed to have uh, been in contact with him. Uh, we were very, um, very uh, unpleased with the way that uh, most physicians that we've been in contact with over the many years uh, and how um, you know, they would respond to us. Uh, typically, you know, five, 10 minutes is your, your average in and out time frame. Now, you may wait in the, the lobby for about two hours, but the actual contact is about five to 10 minutes. And, and uh, the meetings that we've had with Dr. Avedia have been uh, well over one hour meetings. And it just shows that he cares. It shows that he's Going, he's doing his homework, going through uh, our uh, baseline conditions and seeing what uh, our health is and what we have to do in order to improve it. So uh, we both have read his book, which is a phenomenal book. I would encourage all to read it. And um, it, it's, it really sheds light on what is happening in the in our Western medicine world and what we eat, breathe, and and uh, drink, um, and and our health, uh, and and the correlation that and, and what fascinated me, uh, not just with Dr. Ovidia's um, uh, outlook, but the the, the commonalities of, of our health, uh, personal health, and building health. And there is such a correlation as we have shared in the in this past hour. Uh, but I, we we're just super happy to be a patients of his, and we look forward to um, continuance of that and and uh, helping him steer our health in a in a positive way. No, that's great. Uh, well, can you believe that the hour is almost gone? I'd like to maybe uh, turn over. Uh, the floor to our attendees who, who've already been filling up our question tray over here. And, and, and I'd like to just sort of open the floor to them to ask you guys uh, some different questions. Uh, so first off, we, we have a question and, and it says, over time, a person's metabolism changes uh, where maybe foods you once could eat, you now can't eat. You know, how often is a like a full checkup, one of these full workups that you were talking about, Dr. Ovidia, uh, how, how often do you need to do that? 
Yeah, in general, I recommend that uh, people assess their metabolic health with those basic metrics, uh, you know, at least on an annual basis. And, you know, a lot of it you can be doing, you know, ongoing. Obviously, your waist circumference is something you can check on a weekly basis. Your blood pressure is easy enough to check these days, you know, on a somewhat more frequent basis. And a lot of it's going to be determined by, you know, what you find. Uh, if everything checks out okay and you're maintaining the same habits and nothing obvious is changing with your health, then, you know, once a year is probably fine. Uh, but if everything's not okay and as you're making these changes to try and improve these metrics, you know, we oftentimes will be reassessing them on a much more frequent basis, uh, you know, every couple of months or so uh, in terms of the blood work, for instance. So, you know, I always tell people the most important step of this is getting started and, you know, go get that first assessment, go figure out where you are. And then depending on what that first assessment, you know, shows you is then going to determine how you proceed from there. Wow. Yes, no, that, that's good advice. And I think, uh, Alan, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, we, we tend to want to look at these ventilation systems, at least look at them or have the report back from the facility manager at about once a year as well, just to make sure that the, the uh, mechanical systems are functioning well, that there's no obstructions. Is that about right? Yeah, the industry will tell us uh, groups like ASHRAE, uh, NADCA, which is a National Air Duct Cleaners Association, would share a similar uh, recommendation uh, once a year to have it inspected. Uh, there are some new technologies that we have seen recently whereby the ventilation, you can put probes into the ventilation system to regularly identify uh, particulate conditions, not just particulate, uh, but potential pathogens as well. So it's interesting technology that's coming around. But yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, measuring, uh, being, being able to measure uh, those conditions are, are uh, critical. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, and speaking of ASHRAE, uh, Owen Hayes has asked a question. It's it's a pretty specific question uh, about ASHRAE, uh, both 62.1 and ASHRAE uh, 90, as it relates to ventilation for more energy efficient or low carbon buildings and, and how that's impacting the energy code. And he's referencing uh, the occupancy default tables uh, or table one of ASHRAE 91, it, he says that it cuts ventilation down by over 50% in most areas, which could drive CO2 up in those areas, right? And so we know that uh, that could have an impact on human health. Uh, so his question is, what uh, PPM level of CO2 would you recommend for optimal metabolic health? So that's a pretty specific question. I don't know if you guys can probably tackle it if, if you can. Yeah, that's not a question that can be answered uh, um, in in a sentence or two. But you know, typically CO2, you're looking at um, the amount of oxygen in the in the air. Outdoor air typically is going to be around 450 uh, CO2. Uh, once you start breaching a thousand to 1500, that's when you're not. It's not a health hazard per se, but it is a a uh, um, a level of surrogate analysis of, of the amount of, of uh, people in a, in a particular room and, and, and people are breathing. Uh, we had one case, for example, that CO2 was, a, was a, a significant concern. It was in a school district years ago where uh, we were called out to do an air quality assessment uh, to these a number of schools. And the building in general was very healthy with the exception of one particular area, the CO2 was actually over 10,000, uh, which would be, would be elevated. And, and, and what, what the, would happen, in fact, well, we, we went to the school board meeting and, and there was a large room of people there and we shared with them the conditions of the, of the report that, that we were to share with the, with the school board as well as those, those uh, faculty and, and parents. And so they, they got to the room where, or the point where we, we were, we shared with them the CO2 levels were elevated in this particular area, not across the board. And as we share with them the numbers that were, 
there, which was alarming at 10,000. But we also share with them the room number, and all of a sudden you heard this, oh my gosh, you know, this, this hissing in the in the audience, not happy. And unfortunately, they had just taken the SATs the you know weeks and weeks before, and and they they claimed that three or four students had fallen asleep during the SATs. So they they obviously blamed the you know, if, if you had a poor grade, you could blame, well, geez, your CO2 was so elevated, it made you lethargic, sleepy, tired, and, and two or three students. Now, they those students may have, you know, stayed out late at night, and they just fall, fall, had fall asleep, but that's just an indicator. Uh, it's a, a health performance indicator uh, of a building, and, and 10,000 is ex exaggerated. You know, we, we see, a, you know, 1,000, 1,500 should be that, that uh, borderline of what would be considered, you know, okay in a building. Yeah, no, that's that, one thousand. Go ahead. Supposed. No, I said like you know, less than one thousand supposed to be the target. Uh, that not exceeding one thousand ppm. That should be the target. Got and you. you. Have to, also, Troy, you have to be concerned with just arbitrarily introducing outdoor air. If your if your ventilation system isn't filtered, is if it's not dehumidifying you're bringing in outdoor, unfiltered, unconditioned air, which is not a good source, it's a good source for contamination. So by doing one thing, you know, open up the outside fresh air, you're actually causing another problem. So that has to be constantly weighed and evaluated with fresh air ventilation, with dampers, controls, uh, with preconditioned outdoor air, a number of things, pre-filtered, uh, so we don't contaminate the air that we're trying to uh, fix. No, and, and and that was just going to ask that question, Alan. Uh, actually, uh, David Reynolds was asking that question. He says our facility management approach to carbon dioxide concentration, he said, relies on ventilation, but outside air can carry various contaminants and be hot, cold, humid, uh, and that could be enough to overwhelm uh, our HVAC system. So, what approaches do you recommend for existing buildings to be sure that they have sufficient ventilation? without associated problems. Yeah, the, the you know identifying and performing baseline conditions, determining the the uh, health performance index of a building which would include your CO2 and if if they are and and over time, I mean if if you had if you shot up to 1500 or 2000 doesn't mean you got to shut the building down but you have to identify why it did that and that's where um, uh, senses, sensors such as the IQ Guard 2.0 play a huge part in, in main, managing and maintaining uh, a healthy building. Um, but just arbitrarily bringing it in, you, you do want to look at re-engineering uh, the ventilation system to, to make sure that you are pre-filtering, pre-conditioning uh, the outside air before it gets dumped into the air handling system. Uh, because it will cause significant secondary problems. We've seen um, nest birds nesting uh, in the return or or the fresh air makeup supply plenums and pigeon guano stacked up, you know, a, a foot high. Well, that's a whole nother issue. And now you're bring, you're bringing in all that <clears throat> that outdoor air into the building along with all the the uh, the pathogens that ca come with. Uh, the fecal matter of pigeons. I think I believe Dr. Sahai, it's uh, cryptococcus is the is the uh, disease. Is that correct from pigeon guano? Yes, cryptococcus. Yes, cryptococcus yeah. is the organism. Yes. So that's why that's why the building health checks are so critical to understand the building dynamics. Um, just just arbitrarily adding you know fresh air, it may not be the best. You're you're actually better off in that case closing it down, getting the pigeon guano removed uh, and and uh, then ventilating in an effective way. And we, we have another, and that, that's a great answer too. Again, it all goes back to understanding uh, your body, understanding the equipment, right, in a building and, and making sure that that baseline is optimal. Uh, David Reynolds also posed a follow-up question to Dr. Ovidia, and he says, how does stress figure into the metabolic picture, uh, say the daily stress of commuting? Yeah, so stress is certainly a uh, big factor in metabolic health. Um, again, it's sort of one of those uh, uh, 
you know, ways that we are interacting with our environment. And so, uh, you know, when I talk about pillars of metabolic health, um, you know, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe is certainly at the at the top and is the most important, but other things like managing your stress, getting adequate amounts of sleep, uh, getting good amounts of activity throughout your day, uh, these are other pillars of metabolic health that certainly play an important role. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even, again, that could be equated to buildings, uh, the, the stress that's put on systems, right? Like fouled coils where there's airflow obstruction. Now the system is running longer to achieve the same set point or, or thermal comfort, uh, which wastes energy efficiency. It, it starts to put wear and tear on, on the mechanical components. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very similar. I think uh, we want to be respectful of everyone's time. We certainly thank you all for hanging in here. I think I'll take one last question. Uh, I, we've covered this before in past webinars, but maybe we could kind of use it as a little checklist to sort of sum things up. And that's Lee Burge has asked, what advice do you recommend for buildings that have been closed for a period of time due to COVID? Uh, you know, we here in Florida, we, we sort of forget that there's other areas of the country that are that are still operating uh, with closures. Uh, lots of workforces haven't returned fully back to work. So uh, either Alan or maybe Dr. Sahai, what, what do we want to look at uh, if a building's been closed and we're trying to go through a protocol to reopen it? That's a good, that's a very, I mean, let me share it first, Doc, and you can uh, contribute. Uh, but we've had a lot of, we've done investigations in, in hundreds and hundreds of buildings post-COVID that did in fact sit for many, many months, uh, in, in, in some cases years, and be, being able to perform uh, health performance indexes through building health checks, identifying the baseline conditions is absolutely critical. We have seen where buildings that have been shut down for months, uh, if the ventilation system had not been in a good operable condition, will cause significant degradation to the building in a short period of time. And you know they think, well, I'm gonna, I'll just turn off the ventilation system, uh, save, I'll save some energy while our buildings are shut down. That's probably the worst thing one could do, as because you're going to increase the the humidity, increase the dew point, and subsequently uh, create a microbial infestation. And, and we saw that in a number of buildings uh, as we, as our building science team, which our backgrounds were mechanical engineering and building sciences, industrial hygiene that they under, they're, they're studying the buildings to determine what the health performance index is and what they need to do to, to uh, correct the deficiencies, if, if any. I just wanted to add on that, like, you know, if the COVID is the, one of the concern due to uh, which the building were shut down, then uh, obviously it is very encourageable to do the basic COVID testing as well as some sampling for the microbial proliferation because due to the ventilation issue, there is a lot of like, you know, built up and like, you know, once you kind of like, you know, open or reopen the ventilation, there is kind of poof effect, what I call, because is down the stream, there is a like, you know, thousands and thousands of microbial cell if it is being propagated during that time is going to go in the livable space. The other thing I would encourage to do the Legionella test because the water system in the building, if it is being not operated for a while, that is a good fit for the Legionella growth. The other thing I would say that like, you know, maintaining and managing the existing condition in terms of like you got 2.0 or several other devices are there to continuously monitoring the behavior of the other environmental factor, including the temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, formaldehyde, volatile organic compound, et cetera. That is going to be very helpful to make a decision that whether the building is good fit for open or not. And I guess we are almost out of the time. I'm also respectful, but I will be open if anybody has any area specific question, please shoot us an email or something. We can respond it in a timely manner. That That's what I can promise. Yes, absolutely. So uh, guys, thanks. It's been a, a very informative and friendly expert panel. Uh, we hope to do this again in the future. Uh, folks that are still hanging on with us, we thank you for staying with us the entire hour. Uh, we do want to remind you uh, in the handout is is a, is an overview and synopsis of uh, Dr. Ovidia's book, uh, Stay Off My Operating Table. And I, I went ahead and brought this link back up if you guys want to check that out. 
And so uh, behalf, on behalf of myself, uh, Dr. Ovadia, Dr. Sahai, and uh, Mr. Alan Wozniak, we thank you for attending our IAQ Matters expert panel today. We wish you healthy buildings and healthy people. Thank you. Care for health, respect for environment. Thank you.